Man, that little video gets me all excited. I mean, my heart starts beating faster because it's football, because it's comeback, and I think all of us know something about comeback seasons. Maybe the team we love so much has come from behind and won a game or won a season. You know, I'm the guy that uh, a few years ago was pastoring in Irving, Texas, and uh, the church where we were, we're just a few miles from Dallas Cowboy headquarters, which was in Valley Ranch in Irving area. And um, I was pastor there from 1992 to 1999. And I've been a lifelong Dallas Cowboy fan. In fact, I remember coming home from church on Sunday morning with my father, uh, who was a pastor of a church in Oklahoma, and watching uh, on our little black and white set the Dallas Cowboy football team lose every week. I remember (laughs) vividly my dad hitting his fist on the wooden floor saying, Don Meredith threw another interception again, yet again. He was probably the interception leader of the NFL back then. And And I remember the 90s when the Dallas Cowboys kind of took a turn. 1989 was their lowest season ever, 1-15. And And then the next year they won a little bit more. 1991, they won a little bit more and got in the playoff. 1992, the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. Now, that wasn't enough because they came back and won it again the second year. Then they had a gap year. Then they came back and won it again in 1995. Now, I was pastoring, and I could tell the mood of my congregation by how the Dallas Cowboys did the previous night or the previous week. I mean, it was like depression when they lost. It was like exhilaration. Hold them back, restrain them when they won. It was that kind of a setup and situation. We had a couple of the Dallas Cowboys attended our church, and it was just kind of a fun season, a fun era. And when I think about that era, I don't think about just a comeback game. I don't think about just a comeback season, but, but I think about a comeback era, a whole time span in which that team made the change. And I want to talk to you today about having a comeback season, but in a far more significant way, more important than a football team, more important than a sporting event, a comeback season in your life. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at Moses, then Joseph, then we're going to look at a woman named Abigail, then David, then Jonah, then Elijah coming back from depression, and then Peter coming back from denying Christ. And we're going to look at the God who brings us back into comeback seasons of life. I'm convinced we all have different seasons of life that we're in, just like Moses had different seasons of life. If you have your Bibles this morning, take them and turn to Exodus chapter 3 today. Exodus chapter 3 is just a small portion of the life of Moses, but it's a very, very important section of the life of Moses. We're going to read the first 12 verses to launch this message, and I want you to stand with me as we read those first 12 verses. Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, as we look at the story Uh, Moses. Now, most of us know a little bit about Moses. Moses was born during an era where the Egyptian Pharaoh had condemned all Hebrew babies to die, all Hebrew male babies. So Moses' mother put him in a reed, a basket of reeds, and, and placed him in the Nile. And in the Nile River, Pharaoh's daughter found him, adopted him as her own. He was raised in the course of Pharaoh. And in the course of time, saw that the Egyptian taskmasters were mistreating the then slave Israelites. They were in bondage. Moses rose up and tried to rectify the situation by killing an evil taskmaster. He was accused of murder. He ran and fled for his life and now he's been on the backside of a desert for 40 years. So we pick up the story in chapter three, verse one, after Moses at the age of about 60 or 65 has been away from his people, away from purpose and mission, and in the desert, and God begins to speak to him. Verse 1, Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the blazing fire in the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet the bush was not consumed. So we probably have heard the story of this bush which was not being consumed by fire, and yet it was blazing. Verse 3. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. 
When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. That's a term of endearment, by the way. Every time you see in Scripture a name repeated uh, at its call, then you know that's a term of love, a term of endearment. Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Are y'all impressed? I said them all without mispronouncing any of those. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me furthermore. I have seen the impression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now. I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to the Lord, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And then he said, that is the Lord said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you shall bring the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Well, what a text. Let's pray together. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name, to speak to us from this text, not only about the life of Moses, but about who you are, God, how you work, how you speak, how you call. Speak to us about us, about each of us as individuals as to where we are and any comeback season that we need to be in. Father, show us today all these things. I ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. <clears throat> You know something about Moses' past season? If you were to approach Moses at that moment in time and say, what has the past season of your life been like? It would be depressing. Because the previous 40 years of Moses' life have been years that have some peace, some prosperity, but no purpose. The idea behind the life of Moses can be characterized in just a few words, just a sentence or two. He was uniquely rescued as a baby. He had an amazing adoption for a time privileged status. There was a failed attempt to rescue his people that he was responsible for. He was wanted for murder and forced to flee. And a good question to ask is, can God use an abandoned, rescued, murdering fugitive? And the answer is, God can do anything, amen? And you see in the life of Moses, God taking someone who really needs a comeback season, who really needs to see something happen in his life in a significant way, and God speaking to Moses in a powerful way. One of the commentators that I read this past week in studying this text made this statement about the season of Moses' life. He said, this is a special personal appearance of God to an aging exile as a shepherd to initiate the divine call for this very unlikely candidate to be a prophet for the purpose of delivering the Israelites from Egypt. In other words, this is an uncanny, unrealistic, somewhat unbelievable account of how God's taken a man on the backside of the desert and let him lead millions of Israelites to freedom. This is an incredible comeback story. But what you're going to hear today is not just a story about one man, but you're going to hear about the God who initiates and carries out comebacks in people's lives. You're going to see some principles here that you can apply to your life. So as we read through this text and walk through that, there's some things I want you to see, some high points, some mountain tops as we walk through this whole story in these 12 verses. So much more I could tell you before chapter three. So much you need to go home and read after verse 12 all the way through chapter four and following about how God carried it out and finalized everything he was doing in Moses' life. But this is the critical moment. Some things you need to make note of. First of all, here in this text is the call to a comeback season. We see how God called Moses, how God got Moses' attention. How God says and speaks to Moses, 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 by name, personally, in an unforgettable way. 
in order to get Moses to the place of listening to God. God sometimes goes to great ends to get us to listen to him. Look at what it says in verse 4. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look at this bush that was burning, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Now we have the description of an angel of the Lord in the bush, but when it comes time to speak, it's God himself that's speaking at of this bush. Now, God manifests itself in many, many ways, but the first thing that we see in this text here is that God calls us in an unusual way. This is an unusual way to get anybody's attention. A bush burning in the wilderness, along with a lot of other bushes that are not burning, and this one's being burned, and yet it's not being consumed. It's not going away. It's not turning to ash. It just keeps burning, keeps burning. And the Bible says that Moses saw it, saw it was unusual, couldn't figure it out. So he went closer to it to look at it more fully, and the Lord began to speak to him out of that. Let me just say to you, God can speak anytime, any place, to anybody, if we'll listen. But God often prefaces what he says by doing something, letting us be in some season, some circumstance where he can have our attention. Because getting attention to people apparently is kind of difficult sometimes. Sometimes God waits many years before someone's willing to listen to him and through many circumstances. But here's what I want you to know. Here's what the text wants you to know. It's that God is there and that God is not silent. You may be in a season of silence where you haven't heard from God. You may have had years and years, maybe decades. I don't know if Moses heard from God for 40 years or not, but I know this. After all those decades of time, now God is still there and God is still speaking, but now Moses is listening. It was Francis Schaeffer that wrote the book many years ago that got my attention as a young man, and the title of it was, He is There and He is Not Silent. In fact, I'm convinced that God is always talking, but we're rarely listening. So God sometimes does unique things in order to get our attention. You know, you can position yourself to hear the Lord in a better way than you may be hearing him now. So let's talk about some things that you find in this text that happened to Moses that help us know whether God has our attention or not. If you want to know, does God have my attention? If you want to know, am I in a position to hear God, to listen to the God who is there and not silent? Am I in a position to know what God wants out of my life, what the next season of my life should be like, what I should do next, the wisdom I need from above? Am I going to be able to hear that? If you're wondering about that, look at the life of Moses and you can see some things about his life that we'll talk about. Notice these things. First of all, he was alone. Now that doesn't sound all that significant except it's very difficult to be alone today. Moses was alone in the desert, pasturing a flock. So when you're alone, you're far more likely to be able to hear from the Lord than when you're not. The problem is today we're rarely alone. We may be alone when it comes to any other personal presence around us, but we're not alone from the voices that we allow into our lives every day. The media that's always streaming the phone that's always in our hand, the Facebook we're always monitoring, the tweets we always read. You know, I've seen a lot of people that have heard from God and had their lives changed, but I've never heard anybody change from a Facebook post or a Twitter tweet. It's okay sometimes to be involved with those things, but if you want to hear from God, from God, you're going to have to give him your undivided attention. My marriage first started 41 years ago when my wife and I got married, and uh, back in that era, uh, really the way you read uh, up on the day's events was a newspaper. So I always had the newspaper in my hand, and I would open the sports page. How many men in here open the sports page first? Nobody in here reads the newspaper anymore. That's why you're not raising your hand. <laughs> but back in the day, I opened the sports page at first, and sometimes I would hear this really unusual clearing of the throat from across the table, and that would be my wife who would clear her throat to let her know, I want to talk to you, but first you've got to put down what you're reading. Guys, how many of you have ever heard that kind of thing before? Okay, I'm in uncomfortable territory. I realize I'm in kind of uncomfortable territory now. <laughs> let me just say this. I learned long ago that if, you, uh, if your wife wants to talk to you, you better put down everything else and listen to her. 
Now, I want to ra ratchet that up a few levels. If you want to hear God, you're going to have to put things aside and listen to him well. No multitasking while you hear God. No multiple things, projects going on while you hear God. God wants to speak to us. God wants to, to, to let us know his will. He wants to show us what we're supposed to be doing. But first of all, sometimes we must get alone. Solitude is one of your best friends. The greatest times I've heard the voice of God, the greatest moments of direction God has given me are moments when I am alone and it's silent and I've shut everyone else out and I am in a position to hear God. Moses was alone. Secondly, he was listening. He was listening. God has his attention. I like the unusual wording in the text that we look at. The bush was burning and, and Moses, almost like Moses said, oh, I'm going to walk over to the bush and see why it's not consumed. It's kind of elementary kind of language. But remember now, Moses is the author of the first five books of the Old Testament, including Exodus. So he's making a point here. He's saying, as I was walking in that mountain area, while I was pasturing that flock, I saw that bush burning, not being consumed. So I said to myself, I'm going to go figure that out. And so he gets close and that's when God speaks. God has his attention. All of a sudden, Moses moves from doing one thing to doing something entirely different. He's listening to God. God uses things like this, folks. It's not always a burning bush. Sometimes it's a circumstance. It's an unusual event. I've learned in life that when we're at a crossroads of life, people start looking for and listening to God. I've learned when we're in pain, we listen to God. It was C.S. Lewis that says, God whispers most times, but in pain and suffering, he shouts. I've learned that people listen to God when they're dealing with sickness, a disappointment, tough times in their lives. As a young pastor, I watched people approaching funerals of loved ones. I was in one particular funeral a few years ago where I saw some incredible things going on on the face and the countenance of some of the family members. And later on, I learned it was at that funeral God spoke to them in an amazing way, not through the preacher's words, but through the fact of mortality of life. You never know when God's going to speak to you, but the important thing is God uses all kinds of things in order to get us to listen. God causes the pause that makes us look up. And when you go through unusual circumstances, situations, if it's caused a pause in your life, let it be the pause that causes you to look up and listen to God. He was listening. He was ready. You notice what Moses says in this text? Here I am. Now, I don't know what else you say when God speaks to you out of a burning bush. I mean, it's not going to be to pass the time of day. We're not going to talk about the weather. We're not going to talk about the upcoming football season. When you see God speaking to you out of a burning bush, I don't know what else you say except, here I am. Here I am. Say whatever you want to say. So here's Moses responding to what he hears from that burning bush by saying, here I am. How do you know if you're ready. I think Moses was ready. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. But how do you know if you're ready today? I was thinking through how I know I'm ready to hear the Lord. And there were six or seven things that I would say very quickly that helps us know whether we're listening to God, whether we're ready to hear God. One of the things that helps me know if I'm ready to hear the Lord is I'm, I'm reading this book right here, the Bible. Because this is like God's love letter to us. 66 books, all of them have incredible truth for us. It is together the Bible, which is God's revealed word to us. I know when I'm reading the Bible that I'm listening for God and I'm ready to hear God. I know when I'm not reading the Bible, I'm not really listening. And I'm not really looking for God to work. So the Bible is one of those indicators. I am reading it and I'm, I'm, I'm listening for God. Secondly, I'm praying. I'm saying, God, I need some answers about life. I need some answers about what's next, what's going on in my present moment, what's next for me, I'm asking. So I'm reading and I'm asking. That's how I know that I'm listening to God. I know I'm listening to God when I get counsel from other people. When I sense something's going on in my life, but I ask other trusted advisors who love the Bible, who love the Lord, and say, what do you think God may be saying to me? Because I don't want to miss this with my perspective being warped in some way. I want an objective outside view. 
I know that I'm listening to the Lord when I sense him prompt me to do certain things by the power of the Holy Spirit, prompting me to do one thing or another. And I know I'm listening to him when I hear those whispers in my heart. I know I'm listening to the Lord when I'm willing to sacrifice whatever I think is valuable for something that he's calling me to that's different. And I'm willing to lay that down. I've heard the Lord when I'm willing to absolutely realize the point of sacrifice. I know I'm listening to the Lord when I want the objective answer, not a subjective one, not God, I want you to tell me to do what I already want to do, but when I'm saying, God, I want you to tell me whatever it is that I need to do or how to respond, that's objective. It's not subjective. I also know I'm listening to the Lord when all those things are taking place and when I say, Lord, I am surrendered to whatever it is you want to say to me. Because I know you have scripted my life far better than I have. You declare the end from the beginning. I have no idea what tomorrow holds, but I know this. I trust you and I have confidence in you. So I'm surrendered to whatever that looks like. If you look at verse five and six, you also find some lessons about how to approach God. Because here's Moses being attracted to this burning bush. And look what happens. Verse five says, then he said, that is the Lord said, do not come near here, remove your sandals from your feet for the place which you're standing is holy ground. He also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he's afraid. So we have some things here that Moses went through in order to get to that place of hearing God. Basically God says, I am holy. Don't approach me flippantly. Take those shoes off of your feet, Moses, as a symbol of the fact that you recognize you're on holy ground. This is not just a mountain. This is not just a dusty wilderness. I am here. And in my presence, you need to approach it as though you realize the significance of that. So he taught him that God was holy. Sanctify yourself, God was saying. He also was saying, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the, I'm, I'm the eternal God. I'm not just the God of this moment, so what I'm going to do is give you the big picture. I'm going to let you in on my big plan, not just about how to be happy today and tomorrow and that's it, but this is about how are, how are you going to live with purpose? How are you going to live with meaning? How are you going to fit in my grand scheme of things? That's what the Lord is saying. I have to tell you today that the, it's so incredibly, so incredibly simple to sanctify yourself to hear the Lord today because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, thousands of years after the account of Moses, Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross. And the Bible says that we come to faith in Jesus and let him forgive us of our sin and give us the gift of eternal life. That in that Christian walk, even though sometimes we do wrong, when we wanna hear the voice of God, we simply have to confess our sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that an incredible thing? It's not about the shoes. It's not about what the, what the land around that bush is like. It's about have you been to another piece of ground? Have you been to the cross? Have you received forgiveness? And are you walking in the promises of confession and forgiveness? And when you do that, you can approach a holy God because he's invited you to approach him. Just like Moses was invited to approach God in this unusual way. So he was alone, he was listening, he was ready, he was humble. Let me tell you, this guy Moses was a humble man. It may have been that he was humble because he had been in the wilderness for 40 years away from God's people and away from what he sensed was his original calling. It may be that he was humble and we see that in his answer, who am I? He had already experienced some failure in the previous attempt to set the people free and he knew he couldn't do that on his own. So there was a sense of dependence. Who am I? The Bible says that Moses himself said in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, that Moses was the most humble man in all the world. That's a very unusual verse. Because you see it written in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Moses was the humble man, the most humble in all the face of the earth. And then you realize, wait a minute, wasn't Moses the author of the book of Numbers as well? And you have to ask yourself the question, Either he was just having a false sense of humility or he was truly, evidently, obviously a humble man. I choose the latter there because he was. You know, you'll never hear the voice of God if you think your idea is better than God's. You'll never hear the voice of God if you're more concerned about you than what he wants to do. 
Moses had to be humble in order to be used by God. Maybe the mistakes of his past caused him to be humble. Maybe the awareness of sinfulness and God's holiness. Maybe it was the awareness of the incredible grace of God that was speaking to him out of that burning bush on the backside of the desert. I don't know, but all those things came together to make him a humble man. And you and I have to be humble. God, the Bible says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the who? To the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That's what James says. So we have this idea that God is going to speak. He's going to speak to people that are alone, that are listening, that are ready, that are humble. So if you fit those categories, I can't wait to hear what God's going to say to you. I notice something else about this text. There's something in this text that really helps us with the character of the call. See, the character of the call has to do with what God is going to call us to do. The Bible says in verse 7, The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. I want you to notice what God says here. I have surely seen, I have given heed to their cry, I am aware of their sufferings. Listen, this is about the character of God, and here's what you learn about God in this text. Every time you read a text of Scripture, ask the question, what does it teach me about God? Here's what it teaches you about God in verse 7. God knows the pain that you go through. God hears your cry, and God is going to deal with that in some way. Isn't that an encouraging view of who God is? God's character is revealed in the words he says and in the call he places on someone's life. So Moses is being called because of the character of God to alleviate the pain and suffering of the folks who were the children of Israel in Egyptian bondage. This is amazing. So as you look at that for a moment and think about that, notice a couple of points. God's call aligns with God's character. I'm going to give you a warning here as well as giving a biblical truth. Here's the biblical truth. Always when God calls you, when God speaks to you, it will align with his character. It's always going to be in tune with his mercy or his justice or his truth or his holiness. Recently, I read a text of Scripture just in another context altogether. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19, it just happens to be a text that talks about what God dislikes, what God hates. You've read it sometimes in the past, perhaps, and wonder, what's that text for? Let me read it to you. It says, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. These reveal very plainly the character of God, what he dislikes, what he hates. And my point here is similar, that God always calls in alignment with his character. People who feel it's their call to pursue something decidedly unlike God are not hearing God. God will never call you to do something out of character to God. And that sometimes I hear of people and I have to respond to them, no, you're not called to anything immoral. No, you're not called by God to be dishonest. No, you're not called by God to be divisive. No, you're not called by God to be disobedient. His call corresponds to his character always and forever. Keep that in mind. Just so you'll know, I have a checklist about how to know I'm really hearing from God. Secondly, God's call aligns with his word. God is always going to do what he says he's going to do. Look in verse 8. In verse 8, he tells uh, Moses again these words. He says, So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. In other words, God says, I'm going to do what I told my people I would do. I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to deliver them. And notice in this phrase that he uses here, he calls us up, he calls us out, he calls us into a whole new level of life. And that's what was going to happen with the Israelites right there. God was going to call them up out of Egypt, out of bondage, into a whole new level of life in the promised land. This is how God works. 
He always calls you up, not down. He always calls you out, not leave you in. He always calls you to something better, not last. And in Christ, the promises are even greater. Christ always promises us up out of a life of sin, out of a life of bondage, into a life of incredible abundance and incredible victory and incredible freedom. That's what God's calling us to. It always aligns with the call, the character, and the word. Now, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is really one of the most difficult things that people have. And you see this in the life of Moses as well. This is the challenge to believe. If you're going to have a comeback season, you're going to have to believe God for that because you're not going to be able to come back in your own power. You can't change things by yourself, just like Moses couldn't set the Israelites free from Egyptian bondage by himself. He had tried and he failed. Now he's on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. The challenge to believe. If you look at verse 11, you'll see where I see this. But Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I? I want you to know today that when God calls us to something, he's going to be with us. He's going to be with us. That's how God answers Moses. Look in verse 12. And he said, certainly, I will be with you. Isn't that an incredible word of encouragement? I will be with you. You may have all kinds of circumstances that are uncomfortable and difficult. You may be having to face the, 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 greatest, the greatest civilization in terms of military power in the history of the world, but it really doesn't matter what they can do. I am with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to strengthen you. You do not have to do this on your own. When God calls us to something, he's going to be with us. Now get this, don't miss this. When the great I am says, I will, you can believe it. When I am says, I will, and that's exactly what's happening here. The great I am is saying, I will, Moses. And Moses has to come to the place in this crisis of faith where he believes God's game plan. And folks, let me say to you today, you must believe God's game plan. You cannot have junior varsity faith for a Super Bowl victory in your life. You've got to believe God for the greatest thing he wants to do in your life. We're not playing games here. This is life and death. This is all kinds of incredible, amazing things in life. And you must, you must believe that he's going to be with you. Also, when God calls us to something, he's going to change us. You know, Moses didn't do so well the first time, but God calls on him again. And when God called on him the second time, it's really important for us to see God was going to do some work in his life and change him. You cannot do different things by protecting your sameness. And none of us are complete in Christ. Everything about Moses' life from this story for this moment on begins to change. He went from a private life to a public life. He went from quiet to loud, from comfortable to very uncomfortable. He was forced to confront his past, his family, his crime, and forced to get out of his comfort zone. God was going to do something with Moses. Let me say, when God speaks to you and begins to use you, it really becomes about you and who you are becoming to serve him. You say, we're not supposed to say that. We're supposed to say it's not about us. Well, it's not about us as we are. It's about what God is going to do with us as he changes us. And he's going to change us on and on and on as we go through life in order to accomplish all the purpose of God in our life. I don't know how many of you just want to be in that place where you never have to change, but God is not going to leave you where you are. He's going to call you to something greater, something stronger, something more efficient and effective. He's going to change us. Notice also when God calls us to something, he's going to change others. He's going to change others. You're not going to be able to change them. God will use you, but he'll change them. And if you look at the story, that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh changed. The Egyptians changed. The Israelite changed. All because God changed Moses. Because God moved him from one place to another, empowered him in incredible ways. Everything around Moses changed. God used Moses to be a world changer. But God's the one that did the work. I know this is going to happen today. I know people are going to say, but I have so many strikes against me, so many problems in my past, so many things that, that God can never redeem. And I'm going to say to you today that God can redeem anything for his glory and for his honor. Don't you think that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sees bad stories every once in a while and 
turns them around and changes them, he can change your story. He can change your testimony. Lastly, and maybe most importantly today, when God calls us to something, he requires our yes. Moses struggled. He did everything he could to get out of this call, if you keep on reading. But ultimately, he had to come to the place of saying, yes, I will. And I know what I'm about to share with you is a long way from Moses and this incredible thing that God was doing with him. But sometimes we learn small life lessons that serve us well later on down the road. When I was 16 years of age, I was on a basketball team in high school, and we were a really poor team. At the Christmas break, we were 4 and 12. Now, for those of you that don't know what records look like, that's really, really bad. That's four wins and 12 losses, high school, high school basketball. And our coach said, look, we believe something better. So we're going to have three-a-day practices after Thanksgiving all through the Christmas break, and we're going to start off January like a brand-new team. Same team members, brand-new team. And I require that you be all in. So three-a-days over Christmas break, that's all in. You do that or you run screaming out of the gym, one of the two. And he believed in us, and he called us to something more. He said, I'll be all in. You need to be all in. And it was one of those incredible times when we won 20 out of the next 21 basketball games and won the state championship in Oklahoma where I was. An incredible, incredible season looking back. But it couldn't have happened unless we were all in. Now, I don't even know where my state championship trophy is anymore. I'm sure it's rotted. I'm sure it's thrown away at some point. I got a little metal. I've got a little patch on my letter jacket. I still have my Purcell Dragon letter jacket, by the way. You wouldn't want to see me in it at all. I'd look like a 12-year-old or something. But the bottom line on it is, those passed away. All those rewards passed away. But the lesson remains. But what we're talking about in here, with Moses, with God, with you hearing God, that's eternal. That's eternal. That's forever and ever and ever. That's about living life worth living. That's about being able to hear from God Almighty about the things that you need to hear from in your life. It'll make the incredible difference in your relationships, in your vocation, everything else you do, but he requires your yes, your I'm all in. God does not reward mediocre faith and commitment. He gave his all. He gave his all. Have you given your all to Christ, to God? And if you haven't, you can do it now. The God that took Moses and changed everything can take you and change everything. It could be your comeback season. But you need to hear from God. I want you to bow your head for just a moment. And we're going to sing a song and have an invitation. And that invite is to listen and hear from God. It could be today that you need to make a decision to put your faith and trust in Christ for the first time. Or maybe you need to decide to come back to Christ if you've been away. Some of you need to come and pray with someone and just simply say, help me, pray with me about being in a comeback season because it seems like for, for, for long periods of time now, I'm far, far from where I need to be and you're being called back. This very message calls you back. The life of Moses calls you back. The opportunity calls you back. Maybe you're being called back as an individual, maybe as a family, but come back to the comeback season God has for you. I'm going to pray, then ask us to stand and sing. I'll ask our counselors to come forward right now. The counselors, come on. Father, in Jesus' name today, we want to hear you. We want to listen to the call that you put on Moses' life and the call you desire to put on our lives. So today, we position ourselves. We get ready to listen to you. And today we worship you as the God who is there and not silent, the God who speaks, the God who calls. Thank you, Father, that we're never too far out of the game, that you can't call us back. We rejoice in that. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Respond to the Lord this morning.